Raise your hand if you've heard of Coursera. Okay, keep it raised if you've enrolled in a class. Okay, just everybody turn around, look at the room, look at the room. Not bad, not bad. Now keep your hand raised if you've completed a class. Aha, uh -huh. actually, you guys are impressive, but as a, as a whole, we can do better. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how machine learning is powering learning at scale. I'll focus in particular on case studies in the Coursera context, but a lot of the learnings are generalizable across learning platforms um, and other innovations. So what's our vision as a company? We envision a world where anyone, anywhere can accelerate their career and their life through life-transforming learning and credentials. And I'll talk about both of those pieces. It's not just about learning and developing the human capital, it's also about building the credible signals about what you've learned um, that can result in outcomes in the labor market. So why do we care? We care because, and, and I uh, swiped this from Thomas Friedman's latest book, we care because the rate of technological change is increasing. Uh, we see it in our daily lives, we see it in our businesses, and the rate of human adaptability is not increasing at the same rate. And so as Thomas Friedman puts it, we need to bend that curve of human adaptability. We need to accelerate learning and we need to accelerate it for a lot of people around the world uh, and at reasonable costs. And so what Coursera is doing is we are creating an online learning platform. Today we have almost 40 million learners from just about every country in the world. Uh, and we have about 1,500 companies and governments who are sponsoring their people to learn on our platform as well. And those individuals and those companies and those governments come to Coursera to take courses and specializations and degrees, uh, about 3,300 of them, from top industry and university partners. So Stanford, Penn, Google, Yale, uh, and others. So I think when you think about online learning, it's really easy to think about the challenges of learning online, right? So, hey, learners are really heterogeneous. I just said they were from just about every country in the world. So they have a range of different backgrounds and goals. They speak different languages. How do you just land them in the right content? And then once they're in that content, how do you help them be successful? And how do you do that without sort of the traditional support of a brick and mortar environment? So whether it's office hours, TAs, peers in the dining halls. And then once they've you know, gotten through the learning, how do you make sure they're rewarded for that learning in the labor market, despite the fact that these aren't always sort of standard degree or employment credentials? What I'm going to talk about today is actually not those challenges of scale, but how those challenges become opportunities through data. And in particular, I'm going to talk about how we can use machine learning to harness the power of the data and feed it back to, one, better match learners with the right content to meet their goals, two, help them be successful in that learning experience, and three, make sure they're rewarded in the labor market for what they know. So starting with the first, matching learners to content, uh, I still remember my first freshman seminar in undergrad. I signed up for it randomly. It was a 300 level French literature seminar on existentialism. And my learning from that, my biggest learning, was nothing about French existentialism. It was that great learning starts by landing in the right course. Um, so hopefully not all of you can relate, but maybe some of you can. Uh, and so matching learners with the right content is really the process of discovery. And you can think about Netflix, you can think about Amazon, you can think about discovering all sorts of goods and services throughout the internet. I'm not going to talk about those algorithms. We'll leave it to the big guys. Uh, but what I am going to talk about is algorithms that are specific to the learning context and the applications that those are unlocking for learners on Coursera. So in particular, I'm going to talk about our knowledge graph. Um, and I'll focus first, so at a high level, what our knowledge graph is doing is we're taking a robust library of skills, so we have about 40,000 skills, and we're mapping them to the content, so what's the content that teaches those skills, to careers, so what are the careers that require those skills, and finally to learners, so what are the learners who have those skills and at what level. And this powers a range of different applications on the site. Um, to start, I'm going to focus on some discovery applications. And in particular, I'm just going to focus first on the very simple edge between the skill node and the content node. So what this edge is doing is it's estimating for any given skill and any given unit of content, is that skill taught in that unit of content? And if so, at what level? And this model is trained on data from across the site. So we have sources of truth from our university instructors who are reporting what they're teaching, sources of truth that's crowdsourced from learners across the platform who report what they're learning as they're moving through content. And we also have features of the model that come from the text corpus. So what's the frequency with which skills or concepts related to these skills, and what's known as an embedding model, appear within the course. So a very simple application of this edge of the graph is a skills-based search. So this was the first application of the skills graph. And the idea was we want people to be able to find content by the skills it teaches. 
Lots of people are looking for tools or technologies. Maybe they see it in a job posting for a role to which they want to apply, or they see it listed in the requirements um, for a freelancing job that's posted on Upwork. Uh, but they come to us because they want to learn, say, NumPy. So NumPy is a language for scientific computing in Python. And university instructors often will not say that they're teaching NumPy. They often won't say that they're teaching these tools and technologies. I believe this is because they see the tools as a mean to an end, right? You're learning statistics. You're not learning uh, NumPy. But learners are looking to learn particular skills, and we need to help them uncover it, right? And so when we moved to the skills graph, and in this case, skills-based search, we went from having no results to help learners find content teaching NumPy to having several dozen uh, today. One of the things I love about data products, and this is a simple example, uh, is that data products often do more than the creator first anticipates they might do. So our original skills graph only had business, tech, and data skills, um, and it was really focused on those career-relevant areas. But because of the crowdsourcing component of the graph, over time the graph grew to incorporate soft skills, because as learners were moving through content, they were self-reporting, learning confidence and stress management. And this, in turn, was added into the algorithms. And now when learners come onto the site and say, hey, I want to learn, in this case, um, it should be confidence. It still says NumPy. If only that were a soft skill, then I'd have some. Um, but it, so it'll say things like uh, you know, communication, giving presentations, public speaking, and learning how to learn. So this sort of assumes that the learner comes in wanting to learn a skill, be it a soft skill or a hard skill. But for a lot of learners, they just know their career goal, right? I want to be a data scientist. I want to be a machine learning engineer. I want to be a marketing analyst. And so for the next step, we mapped careers to the skills that they require, and then in turn could use the additional edges from the skills to content in order to create role-based or career-based discovery. And this model is powered by a couple things. One is requisitions for those jobs. So what's the frequency with which those skills appear in job postings? But the second is real learner data. So looking across our almost 40 million learners, for learners who are already in those roles, what skills do they have and at what level? And so here's one application. The learner comes to the site. She says, I want to be a biostatistician. We return her a list of courses relevant for that career. On the back end, again, we're pulling in, OK, the career biostatistician maps to a set of skills at particular levels. Those skills map to a set of courses and we can return uh, a learning plan. We can do better still by understanding more about each individual learner when she enters. So what does she already know? And this really gets at the efficiency of learning. I think uh, you know, the biggest cost to learning is not the $49 or $79 that we'll spend. For most of us, it's the cost of our time. And so making sure we understand the learner's baseline ability and are providing her a learning path that assumes that baseline ability and allows her to learn on top of it is crucial for efficiency. So where do we start? We start with measuring each individual's skill level. And on the site today, we have about 80 million assessments that are attempted annually on the platform. We can train what's called IRT models. These are item response theory models from the learning analytics literature, um, which in essence simultaneously estimate how difficult is each question in the skill that it's assessing. And given how a learner does on all of the questions she attempts, uh, backs out her ability. So here's a very simple visualization for what a given learner's scope profile might look like. This particular learner is stronger in data management um, and weaker in machine learning. So in personalized recommendations, we can, for example, recommend beginner machine learning content uh, versus starting in intermediate or starting in advanced. So those are some very simple examples about how we can use machine learning, in this case through our skills graph, to power discovery, whether it's a simple skills-based discovery for someone who knows exactly what they want, a career-based discovery for someone who's oriented towards a particular role, or more involved personalization where we're trying to meet the learner where they're at so they can get to that goal more efficiently. Uh, but obviously, that is only the first step, right? Landing in the right course is only the first step of the learner's journey. And a lot of what we need to do is help learners be successful and stay on track through their learning experience. So I'm going to talk about a single example. It's an application called InCourse Help. But before I do, I want to remind you what the first movie was. We're in a movie theater, so it seemed appropriate. Um, the first movie was very simply filming a play on stage. And similarly, the first MOOC was very simply filming an instructor 
in a brick and mortar classroom. But today, movies have taken a totally different turn. You can do things in movies that you could never do on a brick and mortar stage. And similarly, we want to be able to do things in the online medium that we would never be able to do in brick and mortar classrooms. And so you can think about the range of things. One example is personalized just-in-time interventions to support learners in their learning. And where did this start? It didn't start with a deep learning model. It didn't start with uh, you know, very complex natural language processing to build a question and answer bot. What the neural net does is it predicts, OK, based on what we know about you, both your demographics and your learning behaviors, and what we know about the demographics and learning behaviors of past learners and how well they responded to these interventions. So, for example, whether they said it was helpful or not, whether it moved their item completion or not, whether it increased their likelihood of completing the overall course, we decide whether or not to serve a particular intervention to you. So the dotted line is when we first rolled out the model versus just serving the interventions to everybody or serving them to a subset of people in a rules-based way. Uh, the vertical axis is the share of interventions that are deemed helpful relative to not helpful, and you can see it increase dramatically after the model launched, and then it sort of asymptotes uh, beyond the, that August 1 date. So yes, there are points when a lot of learners drop out. You can serve them customized study guides. But learning is hard, and sometimes it gets really hard. And people will drop out throughout the journey. So if you think back to your best teacher, they weren't just there at exam time. They were there to remind you not to look at your phone or to make sure you were paying attention. Um, and you might think that we actually can't do that in the online context, but in fact, we have a lot of really valuable data that if anything lets us do it, in some cases, even better um, than, than a teacher and do it at scale. So we built a range of nudges. These are about intervening with learners um, to help them get back on track, primarily behaviorally, so emphasizing growth mindset and social proof. Um, some of these happen completely under the hood without the learner directly engaging. In other cases, we want the learner to actually kind of choose their own adventures. Anyone read those? Those books. Um, and so here what we're asking the learner to do is we're saying, okay, what's your goal for this course? And then they have both structured goals that they can set, right? So in, in this case, there's a set of buttons. They can choose one of the buttons. Um, and then they also have unstructured goals. So they could write in some, some free response answer. And for the structured goals, what we do is we marry that with how they do downstream. So how much progress are they making towards their goals? And we use that to nudge them. So we congratulate them for reaching their goals, or we remind them that they're close to their goals. Uh, you might be wondering what we do with the unstructured data. The unstructured data is used to power which goals learners like them are shown as options in the future. So we are not actually on the fly uh, ingesting your unstructured goal and, and trying to serve you some sort of reminders around that. But future learners will then have those unstructured goals as potential options in cases where those unstructured goals are common enough for people like them. So you know what I like about this feature is it's sort of a constant feedback loop, right? We're serving, it's relatively new, we've served um, about 40 million interactions across 40 different use cases or types of interventions. We observe whether or not the learner chooses to engage, whether they say it's helpful or not, whether it moves their downstream metrics versus a holdout of similar users who aren't getting the interventions. And then we use that to determine who should get these interventions in the future. Um, and so the future is, is constantly improving. So that's a simple example of how we're using machine learning uh, to help learners get through content. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, and as any economist will tell you, education is about two things. It's about developing human capital, so landing in the right content and being successful in that content, which means you're, you're learning skills. But it's also about being able to credibly signal those skills uh, in the labor market, so being rewarded for what you know. Uh, and so the final example I'm going to give is how we can actually use machine learning to make sure learners are rewarded for what they know or credentialized. And if I take a step back and think about, again, the learner, not from the economist lens, the learner is wanting to think of two things. The first is I can. I can learn. I can find the right content. I can be successful in it. I can persist through it. But also I want to. I want to learn because it's going to tie to career outcomes and I'm going to be rewarded. Um, and so in, uh, in this particular example, which uh, recently was covered in a World Economic Forum report, um, what we're doing is we're benchmarking a company, an individual, an industry to its peers. Um, and across our 1,500 companies and governments currently using Coursera, um, they're using this to understand who are top performers in what skill areas so they can reward that talent. 
And there are internal use cases. So the software giant Adobe, for example, has a large program on Coursera. They use this to identify which of their backend engineers are well positioned for machine learning roles and rewarding them based on the skills that they've demonstrated on the platform. Um, in other cases, this is about attracting uh, and screening external talent. So Yandex, uh, if you ask someone at Google, they might say that Yandex is the Google of Russia. If you ask someone at Yandex, they might say that uh, Google is the, is the Yandex of the US. But in any case, Yandex is a large search engine in Russia, and they are constantly looking for talent. And in particular, they're very interested in finding talent from non-traditional backgrounds. But the problem with finding talent from non-traditional backgrounds is it's very expensive to screen that talent because by definition of non-traditional backgrounds, you have non-traditional signals. So you don't look on paper like someone who would be successful in the job. And so this is in pilot stage, but Yandex has already hired several Coursera learners based on their inferred skill profiles. So remember that skills graph, machine learning models, understanding what skill each learner has and at what level. Um, for a subset of learners, they actually unlock job opportunities at Yandex and have gone on to be entry level software engineers at the company. So I'm super bullish on the possibilities of machine learning to not just create this sort of set of challenges in the online environment, but actually solve those challenges so that we can match learners with the right content, so that we can help learners progress through learning efficiently, and so that we can reward them um, for what they know. I think we're super early stage in what data science and machine learning can do. Frankly, a lot of building, for those of you who have young startups, you'll know this. I joined Coursera five years ago. Was very vividly remember a lot of building is, hey, let's build the initial platform. Let's build a UI that works for people. Let's get some supply. Let's get some demand. Let's start collecting data. Let's build the infrastructure. Let's build lightweight reporting. And it's only you know a few years down the line where you're able to start saying, OK, how can we take this data? How can we create value for our learners and for our educators and for our enterprises? And how can we feed it back into the product so it's constantly improving and getting better over time? And the fact that that opportunity isn't always on day one can feel frustrating. But I think the biggest learning is make sure you're always collecting, make sure you're always thinking about the long run, um, and really have an eye to those user needs that can be solved through data. So I have 19 seconds for one question. Yes. Yeah, so the question was uh, a big piece of what people need to have outside of hard skills is also soft skills. And I think what you're getting at is also that a big piece of what motivates individuals is the social component. Um, and I think, you know, there are, there are definitely some limitations in the online environment to the level of social. But I think if you look at something like Facebook or Instagram, there's actually a lot of social feeling things that happen online. Now, has anyone read the Matt Gensko? Paper. It's amazing. He's out of Stanford. He ran this study where he basically paid people not to be on Facebook, and he showed that they had better friendships and were happier. Uh, the the there was a write up in the Times, but there's a working paper that MBER just published. Anyway, um, you know, I think I think there's a lot we can do. One to train people on soft skills, and actually, a lot of what people are looking for on Coursera, and a lot of what they're finding on Coursera, saying they're learning, is skills like confidence and stress management and managing people and interpersonal relationships. Um, and so that's something that I think people can learn and take away from some of the content. Um, but the question of how do we help people collaborate and learn together and feel part of a community, I think is one we're still tackling. And Coursera, you know, I, I talk a lot about our courses and specializations, and that's what has sort of millions and millions of learners every month. But we also have degree programs. And so there we're talking thousands of learners who are taking you know, an online MBA or master's in computer science or data science or accounting or uh, you know, from the University of Illinois or Penn, which is the first online program, et cetera. And there we're starting to explore what peer-to-peer -peer collaboration can look like, right? So, so it's different than in the MOOC environment. You're not in a class with 50,000 or 100,000 people. You're in a cohort of, let's say, 800. Um, but, you know, what is team 
work look like? What, uh, how is that evaluated? How do you communicate with those people? Um, and in our particular case, because we're still exploring what's going to work, we don't want to build these all zero to one. So it's a lot of third party integrations, right? So, you know, Zoom is a mechanism. Slack is a mechanism. Like a lot of the things that people use in their day to day life um, can be incorporated uh, into the learning environment and potentially making it more social. But I think we're very early days there and I agree with you. Soft skills and collaboration are going to be really important in making it feel you know, like rewarding. Uh, I think we've come to the end. And thank you, Emily, for the energy with which you, you know, <laughs> came back to the session. <laughs> Please give a big round of applause.